Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Two Daves in a Doc and Guests. And today we have the esteemable Dr. Helen Didon with us, joining us from Ireland. I did get it. I get. I got location right this time, right, guys? Right? Right? Okay, good. Yes, you did. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so, so Helen, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I, 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 by way of example, you are a medical doctor. Am I, am I correct? In yes. Saying? You know, it's so funny how you guys are like, oh, you know, we have all these docs and then a real doctor. But, you know, people actually call me a fake doctor because I don't actually work in hospital. I have the degree, oh. but I and I have the title, but I'm not a real doctor. And, the degrees of the e degrees of discrimination in the doctoral field. My God, you but, know, there's hierarchies to this thing. It's like there's levels to it, you know, uh, which is unfortunate, but there isn't, um, in my opinion, anyways. I just think that if you're an expert in what you're an expert in, that is, it is what it is, and you know, you don't have to be in a hospital to be making a difference in the world. Most of the people who do make a difference in medicine usually are people who've left the clinical world to go into academia to do take the time to do the research and do the things that doctors can't do because they're too busy doing that you know so um yes i'm a real fake doctor <laughs> <laughs> a complicated introduction so i wonder maybe can you give us a rundown of your history how did you get there what did you study where did you study what journey brought you to the point now of being a fake real doctor so um, I am from Nigeria originally. Um, I've lived in Ireland for 13 years now, but I was the youngest of eight. And my family is a very like ambitious, academic kind of family. Um, and we had all the, the professions that my parents could tick off the list of accomplishments. So we had a diplomat, someone in the military, law, accountancy, engineering. And so they're like, okay, this one, he likes biology doctor. So <laughs> <laughs> that was literally it. And then um, I think I mentioned it once, or maybe I got one A in biology. And then they were like, let's put her in hospitals over her summer breaks. This is in high school. Um, but I loved it. Um, and my dad was in the military. So I ended up going into military hospitals. Um, and these are like, there were free um, clinics that looked after all the military in Nigeria. And a lot of these officers were people who were, had just come back from like peacekeeping missions. So Nigeria has a big army. And so they go into other West African countries that have traveled to you know, keep the peace, literally keep peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, a lot of them brought back a lot of conditions from different places into the society. And so they had to set up a free AIDS and TB clinic because obviously with AIDS, it's very infectious and they're passing it on to their families when they get back and so on. And, you know, just a lot of uh, medical conditions are not taken care of the way they should be taken care of, especially in that part of the world. Talk less, like well, with COVID, we can see that it's a global thing, yep. um, but talk less of in that part of the world where there's less resources. So for me at that age, it's so strange. I actually remember just being like, oh my God, these people, they could easily avoid this. They just don't know how to do this. Um, and then I realized that there was kind of like a gap in communication between what the doctor was saying and what the patient was receiving. And, you know, they would just nod and say, yes, yes, yes. And some of the doctors didn't even bother explaining because they didn't have the time to explain what was going on. So you would find a guy with four wives um, coming back from peacekeeping mission, giving all of them HIV, <laughs> then passing it down to their kids. And so I was really like, I was just really taken by that. I'm quite an emotional person. So that really affected me. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I want to fix this, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I, I studied really hard and got into med school and I got into the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Um, and then, you know, I still had that dream of, you know, being able to fix the system of communication or, you know, even things like ads, like, I don't know, well, uh, Dave, you're in the States and you see the, all those ads and yep. like, 
they're very unrealistic. I work, I now work in a, a company where I have to review some of these <laughs> ads where, you know, they put up a picture of really healthy people and these drugs and so on. And then at the end, it's like, but beware of blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Side effects. <laughs> <laughs> Might end up with a vestigial organ if you take this one, but that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but in Nigeria, it was more like, you know, there's a high level of illiteracy and they were putting up these ads in English and so on. And um, so there's just lots of issues in communication anyway. So that's why I got into med school. And then I came into Ireland and realized that if you are a doctor, you spend most of your life in a hospital. And I used to get lots of doctors who like I'd speak to about career options telling me not to do especially women and so on because the work-life balance is hard and like you really have to be called to it to want to do it you know um and I was just like no I want to sleep at night this is just crazy I don't want to be up for 36 hours Mm -hmm. not but it wasn't just that too it was just I just felt like you know I'm a communicator that's what I want to do but I love the knowledge that I'm gaining I want to be able to take that knowledge and find a way to bridge the gap so I just decided early on I was not going to go into hospital and I started looking at options different options but then you know before when you when you think of medicine you think of this like really prestigious career and you think you know once I'm done the world is my oyster I've studied for a million years I've got this I'm gonna get that big doctor money you know but when you but when you graduate if you don't have an additional master's or p or something um the world is not your oyster and your options are very limited (laughs) okay so um i did struggle a bit to find what i wanted to do but i I, then i went into med tech um i went i started i started working for 3d4 medical after graduation um 3d4 medical is an irish company that creates 3D models of the human body. Um, and so I was a medical writer there, kind of rose up in there and did well and became a senior medical content manager. And then I was like, okay, this is great. I'm using tech to be able to communicate, you know, con- you know, conditions and so on to students and patients and so on. But I wanted something bigger. Because I, I wanted a bigger outreach, and I think I was I had grown quite a bit there, but I needed something more like a more challenging um, role. And I just I, I still have that dream of like a more global impact. So I got a role um, as deputy head of medical information in Aspen Pharma Group. Aspen Pharma Group is they have their headquarters in South Africa, but they're global. And this role is about communicating more than what you get in the patient information leaflet from a from a patient pack or whatever, or from online or whatever, to patients, healthcare professionals, press, anyone who needs more information on the use of the product and just more explanation as to the rationale behind different things. And so that's where I am now doing kind of funny how life has just kind of taken me to where I exactly where I want to be but life even though life has worked out that way I've been very intentional about what I'm applying for where I'm going with it because I know what I want to do um and so that's a summary how long have I been talking for <laughs> what day is this what day is this <laughs> <laughs> so that is no. it yeah um, so like, what, what, what's what stood out to me there is that you're very much a person who sees something and then responds to it. Like you, you react. Like whereas a lot of people, I think, are, you know, maybe a bit passive and will not engage with a bit of problem or, you know, might be a bit afraid to, to go ahead. I actually even remember one time I was walking. We were walking down the street and we bumped into you, yeah. and we were chatting about the start of week. And uh, you mentioned uh, about even the diversity within the start of the week uh, element and making sure that the, there was voices there that were heard uh, across. And you actually uh, offered to, to get involved yourself within that. And that always struck me. And, and even just hearing your story now as well, it's quite similar. Like you, you see something, but you don't just wait for something to be fixed or whatever. You, you actually go and do it. But for other people, that can be a challenge. And then what is it that, that kind of gives you that push to go and say, I, I can do something about this. And what would you recommend for people who maybe 
have it in their mind because so everyone has something that sits in the back of your mind that you're like, I can I can do something about that, but maybe you just have to make that step. Like, what is it that gets them over that hump and gives them that boost? I can I just stop you before you continue just for yeah. one minute, Helen? Can I stop you? Dave, can you get that in for interference? Or is it just me? I can hear it too. Yeah, David, I think that's you. Yeah, I just I yeah, I think it was your headset. Don't worry, I'll cut the section out. Not to worry. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, it's I gone. Just yeah, forced... perfect. It's gone. It's gone. Yep. That's it. So. Yeah. Okay. That's that's grand. Uh, we'll just keep going. Uh, unless it was, uh, okay, it was Helen, back to you again. Exactly what he said. <laughs> back to you what David said. No. Put it back in. Sorry. So for me, I I hate whiners. Like I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Every time I'm I'm at dinner with my friends who work in hospital, all I hear is complaining and complaining. I hate the job. I'm like, I hate my boss. I, I was standing for this amount of time and I was blah, 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 and too many hours. And, oh, we don't get this kind of training and we don't. And I'm like, okay, so what have you done to fix the problem? And it's very difficult because a lot of these things are systemic issues. They're issues in institutional issues and they are ancient issues. They're issues that have been passed down over generations and so on. But sometimes I think for me, I feel like, I think I've had it in my head that if you need to make significant change, you need to somehow step away from the mess and then look at the mess from a different perspective and figure out how to fix it. If we are all in the wheel, there's no, there isn't going to be someone to be able to stop. And that's how, that's what I think about. I think, okay, we, 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 Okay, like for example, I'm an advocate for including um, a lot of medical technology in the medical curriculum because, um, we, yeah, well, you can teach doctors on with like textbooks and so on, but um, I think we need more doctors in tech figure because they're the ones who use all the services and products and so on. But if they're not in the process of creating those services and products, then there's a bit of a a mismatch or a gap there, you know, in applicability and so on. So I always, in my head, I just think, you know what, everyone might be doing this, but if I just take some time away and step away from the mess and think of how to solve this issue, I'll be saving time, I'll be helping people, and I'll be making a difference. So we can all if you look at any invention that's been made, like a lot of people who invented anything good were always deemed as a little bit crazy. And I know now in this day and age, when you say, oh, I want to fix the world and stuff, you just seem a little obnoxious and crazy. But I'm okay with being obnoxious and crazy. I'm okay with, you know, sacrificing some social things to be able to spend some more time reading. I'm okay with not working in the hospital even though all my friends are i'm okay with doing that extra course to give me more knowledge so i can have more perspective and more knowledge on what's on things i don't understand so rather because i find that in this day and age there's just lots of people complaining about everything but not many people are very knowledgeable about what they're complaining about so if you can truly understand like what the system is so for example people would be like oh, we don't get enough, this, our community doesn't get enough, I don't know, something, or this vaccine, it, 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 it's been released too quickly. Have you read the studies? Do you know how many people <laughs> were tested? Do you know if the vaccine was being worked on prior to COVID? Um, do you understand what the virus is and how it became this virus? Um, yes, there's lots of conspiracies out there, but have you done your own reading to understand what is really going on, or are you just going off here saying assumptions? So you, you mean Bill Gates didn't stick GPS trackers into the COVID? <laughs> well, I, well, well, I heard. Well, I heard. Controversy. <laughs> You know, like I just and every time I speak to anyone who say, okay, to be honest, I did have like a probably a few weeks there where I was like, what is going on? Maybe they're trying to control 5G, 5G. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I was like, okay, this is just based off just things I'm not sure about. So I need to go off and read about 
what's yeah. going on and just get some perspective for myself. So anyways, this is a very roundabout way for, to answer your question, but uh, I don't my... think I would be able to hear it. There was so much interruption in it when I was, <laughs> when I was talking, probably it's, it's going to be worthless. So oh, yeah. it'll just be a, a cut from you talking to into you talking again. <laughs> <laughs> there's, just, there's, there's, there's some movement there of some lips, right, David? <laughs> I just, just, put, just flash me in in the middle. That's yeah. it, just with mouthing away. Uh, no, you mentioned something you mentioned something very very interesting there and i think it's uh, two things you mentioned are, are kind of stoking things in my mind what you would kind of suggested was you value that kind of top-down approach you are the medical doctor you understand the background but you needed to remove yourself from it to see how all of the interlinked elements play and what yeah. it reminds me of i love watching 24 hours in a and e you know this relatively new invention in the emergency room of you'll know what they're called i don't the person's job it is to manage the critical care scene. Yeah. But they have a specific term. I can't really, I call it the ER manager, whoever that is. You yeah. know, and <laughs> you stand back and you just observe and you control everything while not actually doing anything. Mm -hmm. That site is very, very important. And that's kind of what you mentioned as well. And then the other bit was, again, just to pick up on your, the vaccine is developed so fast. Yeah, I think people are inherently afraid of what they do not understand. And when they try then to understand it and still can't understand it, you kind of run the opposite direction. I had that same conversation with somebody the other day and was trying to explain that there has never been deployment of money or brain power to the same extent as there has been over the last year yeah. in history. You give me enough money and enough smart people, I will solve you any problem. So, you know, that sort of you know, progressive nature. And I think it's just a, a misunderstanding of technology and a misunderstanding of an awful lot of things. I can't get reliable 3G on my mobile phone. I'm pretty sure 5G can't go into my vaccine. You know, so <laughs> that kind of, how do you, did you find any of that as you go on, particularly having worked in technology where technologists, I say that as one, are, can be very egotistical and whatever. Did you ever find any conflict between you know, somebody from technology that wants to do something and then your medical side coming in and saying, well, hold on, maybe we shouldn't do it that way or you're forgetting about these other things. That was my role. Like in 3D4 <laughs> Medical, our team was like the barrier between our very innovative leaders and the world. Because <laughs> we'd be like, I want to do this AR thing for who? And like, who's gonna use that on the ward? Like, no, you know? Um, but also in, in my role now, it's like, okay, you're putting out this ad for, um, for this product and you're saying that it does this based on this study. No, that's not what the study actually says. So we can't really like play around with the information just for it to say what you want it to say. You know, and <laughs> um, so I get that a lot. And a lot of my work is actually like compliance, like making sure that, you know, you're putting out the right information out there and you're putting out things that people actually need or need to hear or need to use and just making sure that the priority is people's safety. At the end of the day, that's, you know, that's what we're doing. We're just trying to make the world a better place, you know. Um, I think that relates to, yeah. to research integrity as well, Helen. And like yeah. for people who are going through maybe a PhD program or going through a program similar to what you went through, you know, I'm sure there's at times when people have said, oh, you know, this is not the results I want, or maybe this paper isn't saying exactly what I want, but I'm going to, you know, slightly take an angle on it or maybe take things out of context mm -hmm. because it backs up my uh what i wanted to say if that makes sense because you're coming in and we all come in with our lenses and our biases and our perspectives and you know we have to acknowledge that but you know in terms of research integrity and things like that is that something that you you've seen as well uh, from a, an educational perspective uh, coming through uh, and I, I guess it's quite interesting here that it's it's similar maybe in uh in the real world context as well because humans are, are humans and they're going to do yeah. things that are not, uh, we'll say, we'll say right in this scenario. But of course, that's a that's a, a word that can be a spectrum as well. Yeah, you know, um, in the medical world, it's like um, you find doctors are really trying to get published, and then, like everyone is trying to get published, and everyone is just trying to publish anything, 
just so they can have their name on, <laughs> they can be first author on something. But not like, I just find like databases are just inundated with like, like very similar articles that may not be as beneficial as the last one that was written about it. You know, they might just tweak one factor and then that's a whole new paper on its own. But, you know, if we could, if we were able to take that energy and that brain power and that time and invest it into other things that really matter rather than, you know, that vain, pompous, you know, need to be first author or whatever, you know, we would be making the world a better place. But on the other hand, you can, if you think about it, people are just trying to advance themselves, you know, make more money, get increase their earning power, increase their impact in the world. I So I get that. But, you know, we need more people just maybe being, just putting a, a stop on, you know, the amount of research that's out there and what it, they're researching. Like, there's already information out there and you're not adding much value to what's going on in the world. Why? You know, that's my opinion of it. But I just see people just, you know, trying to just get published. And it just reminds me of like, I think in my final year in med school, we had like specific cases that we needed to get to get signed off, right? And we're in hospital. So we're spread around the country in different hospitals. And uh, people are just trying to get to, let's say like a patient with some respiratory illness so they can use their stethoscope to listen to that wheeze, right? And I literally saw students being like, oh my God, there's a patient on ward, blah, blah, blah. Like you just got the wheeze going. And you're seeing students like queuing up. This very sick person is just like sitting on the side of the bed being like, sure, listen, you know, and taking deep breaths and getting tired because students just want to get, like they just become like robots. Like you just forget that you're dealing with human beings. And I, I think that that's a lot of the world is kind of, I, I'm, I'm just very worried about the academic world just kind of going towards that direction rather than what it's there for, which is people using their brain and their time to try to fix issues, you know? So, yeah, I see that a lot. And, you know, I, I, I try my best not to be too critical because I'm currently in a role where, you know, I, I'm doing my job and I'm trying to make sure that, like, whoever's using our products is getting the right information and so on. On the other hand, you know, you have to pay rent and you have to pay bills and you have to think about your own life and so on. But we do definitely need to work on finding a balance with that because like, yeah, yeah. we can become agree. very strange. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, no. like, yeah, it's, 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 okay. it's unethical. To, 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 from my perspective, I would fully blame the academic side of that and not so much the medical side. You know, it's like everything, it's become tokenized. So, you know, this process of academia has been tokenized and it's by citations and publications and it's incentivized. When that becomes a measurable metric in your job performance, you just, as very clever people do, they hack the system. They find out what's needed and then find an easy way to replicate it. But I would 100% agree and would be on board with it We've lost that idea of doing work because it is new and progresses us a step forward. And I think if you want an example, just look at COVID in particular. You know, there's been such huge leaps in science, but in the earlier stages, New England Medical Journal, all of these medical journals ended up publishing and then retracting numerous papers because people just rush stuff out to get it out. How many of them have been retracted or rescinded? And a very, very good for advisor of mine over the years had once told me, he said, everyone reads the release. Nobody really reads the correction. Nobody. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, the, that's it's kind of like, it's token hunting. You have a big release, you get a newspaper article, you talk about it on the TV or the radio, you become the talking point for your 15 minutes of fame. And then two months later, when you have to retract the whole thing or make an update to it that cuts all of the content out of it, Nobody cares because nobody's paying attention anymore. And I think that's such a disadvantage and like it removes the humans from it. And do you have any ideas on how we can fix that? How do we bring the human being and that kind of human progress back into this area? 
No, 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 no difficult question there at all. Not a difficult yeah. question. At you know, all. no, 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 no. See, like I obviously see, I, like I'm doing. I'm just at the end of a master's in public health, right? And that's just another way that I was. I felt like okay, you know what? I need to understand how this system works. They don't teach you that in in med school. So having a, an understanding of health economics, health governance, um, and the ethics behind all of that and budgets and so on is is important because you need to understand how um how reforms happen and the more that i go through this course the more i realize that it is somewhat impossible you need to no it's not impossible but i think it's maybe a generational change because you need to the whole system is just very slow and very flawed but just to put it simply i think that there needs to be more i know people don't like regulations but we need to regulate some things we need to definitely regulate the information that is i don't know if that's if that makes me sound like a communist but <laughs> like um there needs to be some sort of, I know there's freedom of speech, but there also needs to be some sort of control on what is fact versus what is fiction or exaggerated. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I can't say because at the moment, um, I don't know, especially in this world that we live in with social media and so on. Um, you really need to be careful about what you read. Be careful about what you're taking in because some things can seem really factual but they are actually aren't um so I, I would say more regulations but i know that that's not a very popular um uh opinion i think there needs to be more uh, oh no do you know even when I'm even saying it i'm just thinking oh you know are you trying to restrict people from voicing their opinions and so on you can't do that so i don't know it's so multifaceted it's so complex that is one issue that I know that I can't stand back from. I'm trying to fix because it'd be difficult to do so unless you guys have any ideas. I actually have one and I'm wondering, so you can let me know the um, Hippocratic Oath. Is that still a thing? I've been reading that it's not really and it's more like a, a kind of historical construct. Is that still a thing? You, I, I don't really hear lots of people just like reciting it or quoting it or, you know, having that being their mantra for how, you know, how they conduct themselves on a day to day. It's just something that people, you know, you have to say it on your graduation day and then once in a while you can throw it into a paper just to seem like, you know, you have a little bit of Latin in you and you're quite well read and so on, <laughs> truly, but um that's why for me, like every time, even at work, I, I just keep saying to myself, like, you know, whatever it is we're writing, we need to think about who's receiving it, who is the end user, the end consumer, the end, uh, who is this product going into and who is going to take it in and digest it and excrete it, okay? And you need to think about the safety of that person first over you trying to achieve your KPIs, over you trying to get that paper published and so on. So if people, that's why I was saying, I think it's like a mental and generational thing. You have to change the way people think. So, and, and I think that the way that, the, well, the easiest way to do this is through education. So our educational systems at the moment are very rigid and very structured in a way that they're not, like they're not too applicable in real life. But then if you could start a kid off you know, with the Hippocratic Oath and making them understand the relevance of that and showing them real life examples of how that comes into play, then you are, you're instilling in them something that would, should be able to stick with them as they go through their careers. But we don't really have those kind of, like, it sounds very artsy fartsy to me at the moment to be like, oh no, kids, here's this Hippocratic oath. You have to think about, just think about how that would play out in real life, you know? But I think we do probably need to, to start thinking that way and thinking in a more humanitarian way when it comes to things. I think the world has become very commercialized and 
people are just focused on the wrong things. But when we, if we can focus more on humanity in everything that we do, you know, we'll make a better world. But that sounds very like Joe Biden's speech from his inauguration, you know? <laughs> hey, there we go. That's a segue to an American. I like it. Just to echo that point. Unity, unity, unity for all. But um, that's what I think. And so for me, I know that I probably... At the moment, I haven't thought about how I'm going to get that message out because that's something I, I have been thinking about. But I'm going to try with my children to instill that in them or with any anyone around me that can will listen to me. You're just trying to promote that message of in any work that you do, whether you're an accountant, whether you're a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher, you know, think about the person first, you know. Yeah. yeah, I think one of those things that, you know, just to echo that point, I was talking to a wonderful uh, woman from Kenya named Wanjeshi, and she was talking about her generation with inside of Kenya right now. You have the colonial, the older, older generation of those, you know, neo-colonial, right? You have the, the semi-older generation ahead of her that's kind of bridging the gap between now the younger generation at 25 to the 42, whatever. I include myself in the 42 generation. I'm right there. But she's saying a lot of what's missing from this generation is, is that is that aspect of critical thinking, which you're 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 touching on strongly. And I would argue that it starts at the young age as well. It's learning how to question, not question everything in the sense that if I can't see it, it's not real kind of idea, but it's to say like this bit of information, I need to know more. And you know, you're you're exemplifying that pursuit, right? Going back into a master's of health policy and health administration, that kind of stuff. That's an amazing pursuit of critical thinking. But a lot of what we see, what ended up, you know, as a token American here, a lot of what we saw from in the last year has been a deficit of critical thinking. It's been easier to accept a half truth, you know, truly, than it is to actually go through and think about the ideas mm -hmm. behind it. Why did this resonate? You know, the yeah. challenge for David and I, and, you know, Colin preceding us in, in our particular program, is exactly that, is to align our head and our hearts to critically think about the problems ahead of us. Why does this matter as an output? Who does this matter to? And how do we conduct ourselves to your absolutely, you know, emphatic point? How does this benefit humanity? That's, that's part of our program is that idea of inclusivity is that idea of social transformation by virtue of what we do and how we study. And it's so incredibly important and so incredibly powerful to be able to sit there. We were talking with a uh, Antoinette the other day and her coming up and saying a doctor from Chile took her paper and was able to identify something out of that paper that one of his his patients had and all of a sudden a 13 year old now has a better chance at life than they did before that's thinking critically that's somebody on the receiving end of something that was generated because there was passionate pursuit and critical thinking on the front end that ultimately ended up benefiting someone you did no idea was yeah. ever going to be part of that. And isn't that inc that's incredible opportunity for us as students? Yeah. It's an incredible opportunity for you both as practitioners of each of your own specialties to be able to kind of enjoin that in, in the world and within academia and outside of it. So I know it's my little soapbox for that. <laughs> no, no, that's great. And I, you know, while you were talking, I was just thinking about like um, one of the reasons why I got into public health um, is I just find that people are always complaining about like, okay, we don't have enough resources. We don't have, like, especially in Africa, like, you know, you think, oh, why aren't, why don't we have uh, free healthcare for all? Or why does this community not have a hospital? Or why are people not, why is the ambulance system not functional? Or, you know, and I, 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 I then thought, I, like people don't really, people think, oh, the government should just give out money and let's just fix this problem, right? And I think prior to my um, master's in public health, I was, I think I kind of was of that kind of thinking, which is like, oh, you know, you guys are not doing the right thing with the money, you know, especially with corruption and so on. And then I decided in this master's in public health and I realized there are too many loopholes from that idea or concept of fixing an issue to when it can actually be um, um, actualized, right? So it has to be, you know, there has to be enough data on the problem first. Now, collecting data is one whole chunk of time, right? Then it needs to get, you need to advocate for that issue, right? Advocacy is another step. It's a, it's a long step. And then 
some politician or some organization needs to take that concept and create a policy behind that, right? And then a politician has to think, okay, this policy suits my manifesto and what I want to be about. So I'm going to take this concept and run with it. And then they have to take that and turn it into like a bill or so on. That has to go through a whole process of like, you know, the economics of it and the funding of it and all of that. And then even if a bill is passed, then it's like the actual um, implementation of the plan. Are you putting it in the hands of the right people to take that concept and actually like put it into action? Is it going to work? Is it going to be received properly? Are you training the right individuals to, to carry out this, to implement this or, you know, and then how effective is it? So it's like, I just, I just thought to myself, I was like, when is anything ever going to happen? Like, when is there ever going to be any change? So that's why when, uh, you know, you see something like, you know, how this quickly, this vaccine has come um, about, I'm just like, okay, guys, yes, even though they studied it for only about three months, like you should be happy that that's happening because, uh, you know, do you want to wait for it? People are like, oh, it's Take, it's happened too quickly do you want to wait for 20 years <laughs> because you want to be in lockdown for 20 years do you know what processes have to be they had to like fast track to be able to get this to happen <sighs> yeah where i was going with that is that we need to understand you know the processes behind you know, every, you, you don't take everything for face value. You need to figure out how this comes about. Because while there, um, there's the front line and everything that you can see on the surface, there's a lot of machinery and processes and administration that goes on behind everything. You know, from the phones you use to, you know, the food you eat and everything. There's always a back industry working and lots of people working towards what you get, what you're able to consume. So... But people don't really think about that. You know, we just take everything for face value. So um, that's my thing. Like, you know, if you want to really make a change, you really need to know how it really works from like from concepts to the end product. And so and then there's lots of spaces that's in there. So you can find lots of there are lots of loopholes in there in the system. So if you can find an area that is not functioning as efficiently as it should, then, you know, find yourself in there and run with it and make a difference you know fix the problem the element of perspective you know perspective in general and i think that's what we've touched on with all of them from politics to healthcare to technology companies i know with the two guys when we work with startups we try to get perspective find the little space where you can do your thing really really well and people mm -hmm. are quite poor for perspective and i say that coming from this was a podcast we started about phds in particular and there's some of the worst people in the world from looking at things with perspective you get so caught up in the minutia of the problem and then again the medical field very very similar you know yeah. whether we're at now you mentioned vaccines people say vaccines have been approved i've heard people say okay well let's give us five million of them right now it's like, no, that's not how that works they have to be made they have to be shipped they have to be transferred and it's not just us but you know people set their barriers or perspective to make them feel comfortable most people don't like stepping out of their comfort zone they don't like taking in perspective so you know i'm sure yeah you, you had a very good broad background from medicine to technology and everything in between with a strong running core of ethics behind it so if if you could give us a kind of sentence to end with what would your be your advice be to anyone that wants to undertake research work like this you know get very dig down right into the core of it with with research but also maintain that external perspective what would you advise them on that path ahead what would you tell them to do i am all about learning and there's so many resources out there you don't it's good to you know enroll into a course to learn more that's fine, but you can, de de there's so many resources out there. Yes, I know you have to be able to sift through what is good and what isn't and what is um, what is valid information and what isn't or what's reliable and what isn't. But I just think that in this day and age, there's no excuse for ignorance. There's 100% no excuse 
for anyone to be ignorant about people, about cultures, about some technology, about um, medicine even, you know, you need, okay, yes, you do need to enroll in academia to gain, gain that more technical information and so on. But don't, I just think that people should not go off assumptions. If you feel like there's a problem, stop whining about it and figure out what you can do about it. And if you can't do anything about it, then support the people who are trying to do something about it. You know, um, we just need to understand that there's so much more to the world than what we see on the surface. And so if you want to have a, if you want to call yourself an expert in something or knowledgeable in something or woke about something, please <laughs> read up on it and educate yourself. There's, my final sentence is, there is no excuse for ignorance in 2021. We'll stop there. That is Beautiful. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we're going to end there. Actually, uh, American has to have the last word always. But anyway, the uh, we <laughs> appreciate you so much, Helen. And thank you for illumin yeah, having an illuminating conversation with us. No excuse for ignorance. I mean, that says it all right there. And uh, we really appreciate your time on here. And uh, we'd love to have you back. I know in the future to talk about some more things, probably in greater depth, even than what we covered today. So thank oh, you very guys, much. I loved this. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. <laughs> Likewise. Likewise.